The Boeing B-47 Stratojet was a long-range, six-engine, turbojet-powered strategic bomber designed to fly at high subsonic speed and at high altitude to avoid enemy interceptor aircraft. The B-47's primary mission was to drop nuclear bombs on the Soviet Union. With its engines carried in nutshells under the swept wing, the B-47 was a major innovation in post-World War II combat jet design, and contributed to the development of modern jet airliners. The B-47 entered service with the United States Air Force's Strategic Air Command in 1951. It never saw combat as a bomber, but was a mainstay of SAC's bomber strength during the late 1950s and early 1960s and remained in use as a bomber until 1965. It was also adapted to a number of other missions, including photographic reconnaissance, electronic intelligence and weather reconnaissance, remaining in service as a reconnaissance aircraft until 1969 and as a test bed until 1977. Development Origins The B-47 arose from an informal 1943 requirement for a jet-powered reconnaissance bomber drawn up by the U.S. Army Air Forces to prompt manufacturers to start research into jet bombers. Boeing was among several companies that responded to this request. Its initial design, the Model 424, was basically a scaled-down version of the piston-engine B-29 Superfortress equipped with four jet engines. The next year, this concept evolved into a formal request for proposal to design a new bomber with a maximum speed of 550 miles per hour a cruise speed of 450 miles per hour, a range of 3,500 miles and a service ceiling of 45,000 feet. In December 1944, North American Aviation, the Convair Corp., Boeing and the Glenn Martin Company submitted proposals for the new long-range jet bomber. Wind tunnel testing had shown that the drag from the engine installation of the Model 424 was too high, so Boeing engineers then tried a revised design, the Model 432, with the four engines buried in the forward fuselage. The USAAF awarded study contracts to all four companies, requiring that North American and Convair concentrate on four-engine designs, while Boeing and Martin were to build six-engined aircraft. The power plant was to be General Electric's new TG-180 turbojet engine. Swept wings in May 1945, the von Karman mission of the Army Air Forces inspected the secret German aeronautics laboratory near Braunschweig. On von Karman's team was the eminent chief of the technical staff at Boeing, George S. Scherer. He had heard about the controversial swept wing theory of R. T. Jones at Langley, but seeing models of swept wing aircraft and extensive supersonic wind tunnel data generated by the Germans, the concept was decisively confirmed. He wired his home office, stopped the bomber design, and changed the design of the B-47 wing. Analysis work by Boeing engineer Vic Ganza suggested an optimum sweep back angle of about 35 degrees. Boeing's aeronautical engineers modified their Model 432 design to include swept wings and tail, resulting in the Model 448, which was presented to the USAAF in September 1945. The Model 448 retained its four TG-180 jet engines in its forward fuselage, with two more TG-180s in the rear fuselage. The flush-mounted air intakes for the rear engines were inadequate, while the USAAF disliked the installation of engines within the fuselage, considering it a fire hazard. The engines were moved out to streamlined pods under the wings, leading to the next iteration, the Model 450, which featured two TG-180s in a twin pod mounted on a pylon about a third of the way outboard on each wing, plus another engine at each wingtip. The Army Air Force liked this new configuration, and so Boeing's team of engineers continued to refine it. 
with the outer engines being moved further inboard, to about three quarters of the wingspan. The thin wings provided no room into which wheels could be retracted, so a bicycle landing gear was chosen. With the two main gear assemblies arranged in a tandem configuration and outrigger struts fitted to the inboard engine pods, as the landing gear arrangement made rotation impossible, the landing gear was designed so that the aircraft rested on the ground at the proper angle for takeoff. USAAF selects Boeing The USAAF was very pleased with the refined Model 450 design, and in April 1946, the service ordered two prototypes to be designated XB-47. Assembly began in June 1947. The first XB-47 was rolled out on 12 September 1947, a few days before the USAAF became a separate service, the U.S. Air Force, on 18 September 1947. The XB-47 prototype flew its first flight on 17 December 1947, with the test pilots Robert Robbins and Scott Osler at the controls of the aircraft. It flew from Boeing Field in Seattle to the Moses Lake Airfield in central Washington state, in a flight that lasted just 27 minutes. With no major problems, Robbins had to pull up the flaps with the emergency hydraulic system, and the engine fire warning indicators were falsely lit. Robbins reported that the flight characteristics of the aircraft were good. Canopy malfunction during early tests of the XB-47 prototype, the canopy came off at high speed, killing pilot Scott Osler. The co-pilot safely landed the aircraft. This resulted in a canopy redesign, and the hiring of pilot Tex Johnston as chief test pilot. Second X model The second XB-47 prototype first took to the air on 21 July 1948 and was equipped with much more powerful General Electric J47 GE3 turbojets with 5,200 lbf of static thrust each. The J47 or TG190 was a redesigned version of the TG180 J35. The first XB47 prototype was later retrofitted with these engines. Flight testing of the prototypes was particularly careful and methodical, since the design was new in so many ways. The prototypes initially suffered from dodge roll, an instability that caused the aircraft to weave in widening s turns. This problem was remedied by the addition of a your damper control system that applied rudder automatically to damp out the weaving motion. The prototypes also had a tendency to pitch up. This problem was solved by adding small vanes called vortex generators onto the wings that caused turbulence to prevent airflow separation. Boeing test pilot Rob Robbins had originally been skeptical about the XB-47, saying that before the initial flight he had prayed to God to please help me through the flight. The aircraft was so unusual that he simply did not know if it would fly. Robbins soon realized that he had an extraordinary aircraft. Chuck Yeager test flew the XB-47 later in its development cycle and years later noted that the aircraft was so aerodynamically clean that he had difficulty putting it down on the runway. X model competitions by mid-1948, the Air Force's bomber competition had already been through one iteration, pitting the North American XB-45 against the Convair XB-46. The North American design won that round of the competition, as an interim measure. The USAF decided to put the North American bomber into production on a limited basis as the B-45 tornado. The expectation was that B-45 production would be terminated if either of the remaining two designs in the competition, the Boeing XB-47 and the Martin XB-48, proved superior. It is sometimes claimed that the final production decision was made as a result of Boeing President Bill Allen inviting USAF General K.B. Wolf, in charge of bomber production, for a ride on the XB-47, a formal contract for 10 aircraft was signed on 3 September 1948. 
Design Overview The XB-47, which looked unlike any contemporary bomber, was described by some observers as a sleek, beautiful outcome that was highly advanced. The 35-degree swept wings were shoulder-mounted, with the twin inboard turbojet engines mounted in neat pods, and the outboard engines tacked under the wings short of the wing tips, with the exception of a change from the shoulder wing configuration to being under the fuselage and cockpit seating to side-by-side. -side. Most future airliners would use a similar configuration, with the engines mounted in underwing pylons. This arrangement would reduce the bending moment at the wing roots, saving structural weight and having the mass of the engines acting as counter-flutterweights, too. The wing airfoil was identified by Boeing as the BAC-145, but this was actually the NACA-64A12 mod airfoil. The wing's flexibility was a concern, as it could flex as much as 5 feet up or down, and major effort was expended to ensure that flight control could be maintained as the wing moved up and down. As it turned out, most of the worries proved unfounded. The aircraft's maximum speed was limited to 425 knots to avoid control reversal, where aileron inputs by the pilot would cause the wings to twist and produce a roll in the opposite direction to that desired by the pilot. The wings were fitted with a set of Fowler flaps that extended well behind the wing to enhance lift at slow speeds. The XB-47 was designed to carry a crew of three in a pressurized forward compartment, a pilot and co-pilot, in tandem, in a long fighter-style bubble canopy, and a navigator, bombardier in a compartment in the nose. The co-pilot doubled as tail gunner, and the navigator as bombardier. The bubble canopy could pitch up and slide backward, but as the cockpit was high off the ground, Crew entrance was through a door and ladder on the underside of the nose. The extreme front of the nose was initially glazed to allow visual navigation and bomb sighting, but this was quickly and increasingly fared over with metal. Almost all production versions had a solid metal nose with no windows. AK series bombsite provided integrated radar navigation and visual navigation, with the optical portion extending through the nose of the aircraft in a small dome. Engines and performance The first prototypes were fitted with General Electric J35 turbojets, the production version of the TG-180, with 3,970 lbf of thrust. Early jet engines did not develop good thrust at low speeds, so to help a heavily loaded bomber take off, the XB-47 prototype had provisions for fitting 18 solid-fuel rocket-assisted takeoff rockets with 1,000 lbf of static thrust each. Fittings for nine such units were built into each side of the rear fuselage, arranged in three rows of three bottles. The performance of the Model 450 design was projected to be so good that the bomber would be as fast as fighters then on the drawing board, and so the only defensive armament was to be a tail turret with two 50 and an M2 Browning machine guns, which would in principle be directed by an automatic fire control system. The two XB-47s were not fitted with the tail turrets as they were engineering and flight test aircraft. Indeed, the prototypes had no combat equipment at all. The one problem with this early design was that at higher altitudes where the pure turbojet engines could produce decent fuel economy, the wing was very compromised. At the top of the B-47's envelope, about 37,000 feet, the B-47 was in Coffin Corner. That means that at this level, which produced the most range at most weights due to fuel consumption, there was an envelope of five knots between maximum Mach and stall speed. Since this airplane had a rudimentary autopilot at best, it meant that if the B-47 was going to cross the Atlantic Ocean, it had to be flown this high and the pilot had to leave the autopilot off and needed to spend up to eight hours staring at the airspeed and manipulating the throttles in order to not fall from the sky. To put this in perspective, a modern Boeing 757 has over 50 knots of difference at even a very heavy weight at 41,000 feet. 
Fuel capacity was enormous, at 17,000 U.S. gal, more than triple the 5,000 U.S. gal on the B-29 Superfortress. That meant that maintaining fuel trim to ensure a stable center of gravity in flight would be a very critical co-pilot duty. The total bomb load capacity was to be 25,000 pounds. Production aircraft were to be equipped with state-of-the-art electronics for navigation, bombing, countermeasures, and turret fire control. Drag chutes A related problem was that the aircraft's engines would have to be throttled down on landing approach, since it could take as long as 20 seconds to throttle them back up to full power. The big bomber could not easily do a touch-and-go momentary landing. A small approach chute provided aerodynamic drag so that the aircraft could be flown at approach speeds with the engines throttled at ready to spool up medium power. Training typically included an hour of dragging this chute around the landing pattern for multiple practice landings. The aircraft was so aerodynamically slick that rapid descent from high cruise altitude to the landing pattern required dragging the deployed rear landing gear. The relatively high wing loading required a high landing speed of 180 knots. To shorten the landing roll, Air Force test pilot Major Guy Townsend promoted the addition of a 32-feet German-invented ribbon drag chute. For the same reason, the B-47 was the first mass-produced aircraft to be equipped with an anti-skid braking system. Production numbers The total number of B-47s built was 2,032.